To start working in Photoshop, what we really need to do is first learn about pixels. Pixels are the points of color data within an image. And images can have a few pixels or a lot of pixels. The more pixels you have, the more color data you have, thus the higher the resolution is of the image. So if you want an image to display bigger or on a bigger device or screen and look good, it needs to have more pixels. If we think about our televisions at home, they used to be standard definition and then high definition and then 4K and now they're moving even beyond that into 5K, 8K and just ridiculous high resolutions. This is great when you have a really big screen, when you have a image on a smaller screen, we may not need as much data because the screen itself is limited into the amount of pixels it contains. So if we look at a cell phone screen versus a laptop screen versus a desktop computer monitor, they all have different amounts of pixels. So in these two versions of the same image, one has fewer pixels, one has more pixels. Right now they look about the same. And if I go under image and choose image size, I will see that the one on the right has 640 pixels wide, 800 pixels tall. If I look at the one on the left, this one has 2,800 pixels wide, 3,500 pixels tall. Significantly more color and image data. Now if I zoom in, we can see the individual pixels. These squares, each one is a dot representing a piece of color information. So here where I can see the eye, going to leave it where I have white, iris, and pupil. Now if we do the same thing on this image, when I zoom in and try and get the image, we can see that there's considerably more information. It's a much denser amount of pixels. So when I put it onto my computer screen, make the squares about the same size, we can see that I see significantly less information. So I really had to move around to find the pupil when we're looking at squares about the same size. And that we can also see the zoom factor on the pixels going from 100%, which would be a one-to-one. -one. This is now zoomed in 9,640%, where this is zoomed in 8,390%. So they're zoomed in kind of about the same, but we can see it's clearly not the same amount. So if we go to 100% with it, and see what this image looks like at 100%. Now, this image at 100% is that. So, very different size. So, approximately one quarter the pixel resolution. So, understanding pixels is key to working in Photoshop because everything we do with our tools, we're selecting pixels, we're coloring pixels, painting pixels, copying pixels, pasting pixels, manipulating those pixels, but everything is about those pixels and affecting the color data in each little square in the image. That is what Photoshop is all about. So after that brief segue into pixels, now we're going to talk about Photoshop specifically. So when you launch Photoshop, you're presented with a window that will look something like this. Once you've had documents open, they will show up in your recent documents that will be down here. So you could drag and image your document down here to this area to open it. We could create a new file so I can choose open to open an existing image or I can choose new file and I can now choose what I want to do. It always remembers what you've done in the past. So if you've made 
various sized images, it's going to know those unless you clear out those settings because we're under recent. We can look and see there are template sizes to work with. So if I'm designing for the web or if I'm designing for film and video, so we can see our HD settings, um, our 720 HD, 1080 HD. So we have different sizes we can work with. I'm going to create a document at six inches by nine inches, 300 DPI. And you can do the math on that to figure out that we're really looking at 1800 by 2700 pixels, just for comparison to the previous images that we looked at before. So if I open, it creates a document. Now, the Photoshop layout, at times you will mess it up. So before we even discuss what these items are, what you may find is, oh look, I can move something around and then I close it and then I decide, oh, I want to mess with my colors and I don't see colors there. Oh good, well at least I have swatches to choose from. But wait, I drug those off and they disappeared and then I pulled my layers off and it, oh, I've made a mess out of things. So if you're working, Invariably what's going to happen is your layout is going to get a little bit messed up. You may lose track of things and you want to find them again. So to do that, what we can do is go under window and choose workspace and then reset it. So I always try in my videos to use the default workspace so that it matches what everyone else has. There are times where we may change the workspace to something else for a specific activity, but this is a good one to start with. You can also modify um, workspaces so you can drag these windows around. We can add other ones. So if I open another window, say I want to add text, so I want to work with that, I can then look for uh, paragraph and character. So if I go under character, it's thinking, and now it added character and paragraph to my little pop-up toolbar there. Show, hide. So that's just a nice convention to work with. Now, we have our tool options. This top bar here is context sensitive and it will change based on what tool is selected. So as I move through my different tools, we can see how what is on that top bar changes. So if I'm on the paintbrush, I have brushes and brush modes and brush opacity. If I'm on the move tool or selection tool, we can see how it gives me different options. The marquee tool, lasso tool. Now some of these tools, if we look close, we will see that they do have a little triangle in the corner. And that triangle in the corner there indicates that there are more tools available for that one. So like this tool right here, the frame tool, there's no option in the corner. But on the lasso tool, if I click and hold down, I'll see that I have three different kinds of lassos. The marquee tool, if I click and hold down, I have four kinds of marquees. The Select tool, I have the artboard tool and move tool. The quick select tool gives me the magic wand, quick selection, and object selection. These three tools are ones that we will use extensively to make selections on our images. We have the crop tool. So these beginning tools, these are selection tools and document tools that have been grouped or arranged on our toolbar. Now we have the eyedropper tool, and it also, they've tucked the ruler tool under there. No, 10, 1, 2, 3, count tool, color sampler tool. Um, the eyedropper is a useful tool for when you're selecting images or colors in an image so that you can then work with that color, paint with that, or fill with that color. So the eyedropper is useful for that process. And we have the... Um, spot healing brush tool of which we have lots of variations if you need to fix red eye though most cameras don't seem to generate red eye like they used to because our cell phones are much better at it but old digital cameras red eye was 
always a problem. Uh, we have lots of paintbrushes to choose from. We have the clone stamp tool and pattern stamp tool, the history brush, the eraser tool, background eraser, magic eraser. Those are all always super awesome. Gradient tool, paint bucket tool. So if you're looking for a traditional just paint bucket tool just to fill a selection with color, that's where it's hidden, which is under the gradient tool. Then we have our blur tool, sharpen tool, smudge tool, dodge and burn and sponge. Dodge will then uh, remove exposure from an image, this making it um, a little bit lighter. Burn will start to overexpose and then sponge will desaturate or remove color. We have the pen tool, which is useful for creating vector shapes. So the pen tool here works similar to the pen tool in Adobe Illustrator, but not the same. Clearly not the same. Then we have our type tools, and then we have our uh, path selection and direct selection tool. Those work the same as they do in Illustrator. One is for choosing the whole path, one is for choosing points on the path. The white one chooses individual points. We have our shapes that we can work with. And when you work with the pen tool, you can create a shape. That's useful. The hand tool for moving around an image. Rotate view tool, which is really nice when you are painting because you can turn your document so that you're moving in the direction that your hand and wrist moves because it gives you that ability to spin it. Well, it's easier to just see it. But I can now spin it. So then if I am working with the paintbrush tool and painting something, I can move in a direction that is comfortable for my hand so that I'm not having to turn my wrist at a funny angle while I'm painting. So that's a really useful option. Now the hand tool, I never use the hand tool directly because when you have any other tool selected, if you hold down the space bar, it pulls up the hand so then you can move around. So if you are zoomed in and want to move around, now the hand tool allows you to move around. And you can actually do this where it's fun to throw your image. Now if I go back to my rotate view, I can reset the view and now I'm back to normal. Then we have the magnifying glass which zooms in. Z is the keyboard shortcut, you will notice as I've been talking, a lot of these little tool tips have been showing up and there's a letter next to them and that tells you what key on the keyboard will access that tool. Now the zoom tool allows me to zoom in. If I hold down the option or alt key, I can zoom out. So that is useful. Now if your mouse has a scroll wheel on it or your uh, trackpad is set up to respond to that, um, you can, when you are in another tool, you can scroll in and out using your scroll wheel by holding down Alt or Option. So you don't have to choose the Zoom tool. The same way you don't have to choose the Hand tool, you can just use the keyboard shortcut. So Alt or Option and the mouse wheel zooms in and out. Space bar gives you the hand. Well, there's nowhere to move when we're zoomed so far out. Now, another common shortcut for zooming is using Command or Control and plus or minus. Now, when I say Alt or Option, Alt is for Windows, Option is on the Mac. Now, every keyboard shortcut in Photoshop is the same except for the modifier keys. So, everything on the Mac is going to be with the Command key if it uses command to do it, and on Windows it would be control. So if I hold down command and you hit the plus key, zooms in, minus key zooms out. Now if I'm on Windows it would be control plus and control minus. So keyboard shortcuts are command or control and then whatever comes after it, or alt or option, and whatever comes after it. So Eventually you stop kind of caring which platform you're on. You just know that those are how the keys function. So we have our toolbar options up at the top. So it's our control palette up here. We have the tools 
down here that we can work with. So we have selection tools, we have pixel manipulation tools, so from the spot healing brush, clone stamp and paint brush, and history brush, eraser, and then we have more process tools of the gradient and paint bucket, and then our blur sharpen, dodge burn, um, and then our vector tools are clustered here, and then we have utility tools. So our rotate view and hand tool as well as the magnifying brush. Now down below that you'll see two squares and those represent what is called the foreground color and the background color. So the foreground color is the color that we are working with. Now we can click there and then choose and mix a color to work with and now we can see that swatch changed. And we can also change it in the color palette over here on the right. So I prefer using the color triangle with the wheel. I just enjoy that as a way of mixing my colors. Sometimes you may want to use sliders, so you choose your RGB sliders. Or you could choose CMYK sliders if you're working in CMYK for your image. Um, you can choose the hue cube, some people like that, which is similar when you choose foreground and background, you're typically getting some variation of the hue cube, just reverse ordered here, so I can choose lighter or darker, and then the color I'm looking for. Now, you also notice when I'm using color picker here, I can actively type in the numbers if I know I need a specific color. So that's really useful when I am designing and have to adhere to a certain color spec. So if I've been told that it's using a particular CMYK color or RGB color or web color, I can type that in. So once I've chosen my foreground and background colors, I can now work with those. And I'll just return my brush opacity back to 100 and now I can see I am working with that. Now, here where I have my foreground background, we have this little arrow next to it, and if I wait for the tooltip, it tells me, hey, switch the foreground and background colors. Sure, why not? So now I can do that, and I can switch those colors. So there's a lot of things that we can do here while we are working with the tools, and over time you're going to become experienced using a uh, variety of these tools and the deeper you go the more you're going to learn and it just keeps growing and growing from there. Now one thing you'll notice is every time I paint and I'm just going to switch this back to my color wheel because I prefer that. So every time I paint something it's showing up on this layer. So if I wanted to make my artwork mobile so that I could move things around or keep it separated, what would be nice is if I could have layers. And well, this is the layers window or palette. So if I go down to the bottom, the tooltip says create a new layer. So I'll click on that. And when I do so, I get a new layer. Now, if I grab a new color, and paint on this layer, we will see that that thumbnail here shows me what is on this layer, which is super awesome. What's also nice is I can use the move tool and move this around. You can see I painted and it was at the edge, so it didn't extend that, but that's okay. But the pixels on the other side are still part of that layer, so if I were to grab my paintbrush and continue it out. Now we have a completed triangle that I can move around. So that is a handy way of working. Now this is where it becomes time to talk about our control palette up here. Now we can modify what's on a given layer when it's not the background layer by using Edit Transform 
and we can choose different transform properties. We can also choose free transform, which has a shortcut of command or control T. And then we'll see it adds these handles. These are my transform handles that allow me to scale it. So I can scale it up and down. If I move just off of the corner, we'll see how it shows me a rotate arrow. So I can now rotate it. And if I want to skew it or move it disproportionately, if I hold down Command or Control, I can skew it. And if I want to scale it disproportionately, then I hold down Shift, and now I can scale it. So it used to be, up until the last two versions of Photoshop, you had to hold Shift to keep it proportional. But the majority of the time when you're scaling an image, you want to scale it and maintain its original proportions. You just want to make it bigger or smaller. You're not trying to make it skinnier, fatter, shorter, or taller. So once you're done modifying the image how you want it to be, up at the top you have an option to either cancel this and it goes back to its original form, or you can accept it. Notice also it tells you escape will cancel and enter will accept it. Now I accept it and now this layer has been transformed. I'm going to add another layer and I'll just choose another color here. And this time when I grab the paintbrush, well I'm going to just modify my brush a little bit, make it a little bit smaller, and I'm going to go, if we notice here it says hardness, 0%. I'm going to put it up to 100. Now this time, you'll see my brush has a crisp edge. It is not fuzzy on the edge. So hardness has to do with how feathered or soft the edge of that brush is. And I just want it to show up in the thumbnail as well so we can see that, even though I know the yellow is there, but it's hard to see it. So I added the purple so we can see what is happening. Now when I have a layer here, I can move this layer on top. I can put this one back on top. So we can adjust the layers by simply dragging them around. But if I try and do that to the background layer, you see it gives me the little uh, no thank you circle with the circle with the line through it. No, it's not going to allow me to do that. And that's because the background layer is considered a special layer and it is locked. We can see that by the lock icon over here. It also means that our image has an opaque background. It's not a transparent background. So if we want to make our background transparent, then we have to do something like turn off the background layer and look at the other layers. And now we can see we have this checkered board pattern. And that indicates that this artwork is transparent on its background. So the only pixels that have color information are the blue, purple, and yellow pixels. And the rest of the image is being rendered with an alpha channel that will be transparent. Now, we have to save it in a certain format to maintain that because not all formats, if I go and save my document, not all formats support transparency. When you first save, you only have a few options to choose from. And I'm just going to give this a name and save it. Now it's been saved. Now if I choose save a copy, you will see that we have a lot more options in which we could save the document. So standard JPEG does not support transparency. PNG, we can add in transparency. But typically if you need transparency and it's a flat image, PNG is going to be the probably your best bet at the moment for most purposes. If you don't need to save it down and want to maintain your layers and work with that, then we have more options by maintaining our layers. So if we want to maintain our layers, Photoshop is the best. And Photoshop is going to work with most of the major programs that you're going to be 
bringing assets into. So sometimes you can just bring the layered Photoshop file directly into the other program, such as After Effects, Premiere, uh, Illustrator. So when we're working between tools, it works pretty well. There are many different ways to combine together different images and work with them. One way is to drag, and I'm going to discourage that because when you drag into the Photoshop window, it adds the, light, the document as a smart object, so it's linking to it, but it's not embedded into it. And in doing so, it's possible to lose track of your original sources if you're not good at file management. So I am going to recommend that when you want to open a file in Photoshop is you choose File Open. And when you do that, then I can go and grab, no, I don't want to choose that one. Yeah, we'll choose that. And I think I want this picture here and this picture here. So I'm going to go grab those three pictures that I have and open them up. So these are just some stock resources that I have obtained. So going back to kind of our original thought of, okay, I want to, let's say, combine this picture with something else. I want to change the background. So maybe I want to put that character in, eh, maybe I'll put him in this background here or the other one. When we're done, it won't really matter. We can try both. So one thing that we could do is we could use the eraser tool. Now the eraser tool, oh, look, I erase and we're seeing green because when I erase on the background layer, it reveals the background color, which in this case is green. Yeah, I don't want that. Now you can undo things using the keyboard shortcut of Command or Control Z. Otherwise, under that at pull down menu, you will see it's the first option there. It's really common to leave your left hand on the keyboard being ready to hit Command or Control Z at all times while you're working on the computer. So I can work with the eraser and I could choose um, a different color. If I want to return to black and white, the original colors, I can click this little button here or, and we'll see it also as a keyboard shortcut of the letter D and then now when I go, we can see it erases to white. Okay. The eraser is simply a brush. So I could make that brush really big. And now I am erasing a bunch. But the problem about doing this is you have to be really... Oh, wow. Yeah, we just erased like half his head. That's not good. So maybe the eraser is not the best tool for extracting something. But there are some other ways that we can go about doing this. Now, if I want to combine this face with one of these landscape images, one thing that I like to do is to do it in two steps. You can do it in one step and often, you know, it works okay if you do that. Now I can use the quick select tool and it looks like I need a, I'm gonna make the quick select tool bigger. And there are keyboard shortcuts for making your brush bigger and smaller and it's the square bracket keys. So right above the return key on your keyboard, you'll see two square brackets and those go bigger and smaller. Otherwise I can click here and choose the size of my brush. Now the quick select tool can make short work of images where there's high contrast but if I look, what happened here is it's not selecting that part of his hair, so it's failing in that regard. Now, to correct that, I am going to make my brush a little bit smaller. And looking close, we'll see we have the Add to Selection option here. Now, I could click on Subtract Selection, and now my circle has a minus in it. It doesn't really show at this resolution, but it does. And now I can push that edge out. 
I can also get to that same result when it's on plus by holding down the option key and it goes from plus to minus. Um, it just it's changing. You can see it blinking in the middle of my brush circle, but it's really kind of hard to see. We also lost his eyebrow. So I'm going, whoop, I forgot. Undo that. See, again, my hand is right by the modifier keys along with Command or Control Z. And I'm just going to push out to maintain his eye. And now I will take a little bit away right there. And we'll, whoop. Uh, push out just a little bit more there. All right. So now I'll, well, don't want to zoom quite that far. Um, looking pretty good around there. I do want to go grab the rest of his suit coat. So we'll, oh, I uh, forgot which color I was, that I forgot I was trying to capture him and not the background. So now I've selected the whole background. And if I hit delete, we can see, hey, look, we can fill it with white. Okay, let's see what it looks like. Hey, and just for kicks, we can see that, yeah, that's a pretty good selection. All right. Now, the reason that I selected the background and not him, even though what I want is him, is it's a more continuous color area, making it easier to achieve that selection because the quick select tool really looks for continuous areas of value and tries to select those so when it's all a similar tone like this that makes it easier to select it but i want to reverse the selection that i have and to do that i can go under the select menu now one of the key things in photoshop we're not going to go through each and every item on the menus and explain it in academic esoteric detail because there's just too much stuff there and not enough time to do all of that. Instead, I'm going to ask for you to use your brain and think about what am I trying to do? I've now made a selection. Looking at the menu options, I see select as an item up there. It would be logical then to click on that and see what options I get. And I see how I can modify my selection. I can make it bigger. I can make it smaller, I can feather the edge on it. Uh, I could choose select similar if I wanted. We also have options to select sky or subject, so we can even try and just use AI to do it. But the thing we want to do is invert or inverse our selection. When I do that, now he is selected. So if I were to hit delete, he goes away. So Right there, I know that that's going to give me more of what I want. Now this, because the subject is relatively contrasting to its background, that's making our job a whole lot easier here. Now that I've done that, one thing that I can do is I can go under edit and choose copy, hop into the other photo. Yeah, I wanna put them in the, kind of the night mountain sky here first. And now I can choose Edit Paste. And we notice it's also Commander Control X to cut, Commander Control C to copy, Commander Control V to paste. If you look down in your keyboard, you'll see Undo is Z, cut is X, copy is C, and paste is V. Z, X, C, V, four keys all right in that bottom left corner of the keyboard. Your hand is by the Control Option Command keys, and then you have those four letters. So that's why your left hand should always be on the keyboard when you're working in Photoshop because you're going to be using these regularly as you progress. Now if I paste him in, go back to the move tool, move him down, he has now joined our image. So that's a very easy way to do a simple selection. Now, if I wanted to, and a different technique that I like to use sometimes, is the first thing I do is I just do, let me just, I like to be zoomed out just it's faster, is I do a very rough selection. Copy that. 
jump into my image and paste it in. Once it's pasted in, then I go through with the quick select and start working on it. I've found over time that it actually works better to do it in pieces and not necessarily try to do the whole thing, especially, and remember, I want to push that edge back, so I hold down Alt or Option to push it back out. So it works better if I do it in pieces instead of trying to now I grab that whole chunk and we can see it still has the same two problems it had before of the hair at the forehead and the eyebrows so we'll have to zoom in and I'm using the alter option and scroll wheel that's how I'm able to control my zoom in and out very quickly hold down alter option to push my edge out push that edge out push that edge out spacebar to get the hand move up to capture his hairline, alter option to push that edge out. And let's get a little more. And we'll add a little bit back to capture the rest of it. So sometimes it's kind of this give and take. You push, you pull, you push, you pull until it lines up. Hit delete. And now undo. And we can see how he has been positioned nicely. Now I want to go to edit, choose transform and I'm going to flip him horizontally. Got the move tool. I'm going to move him over a little bit so he's now staring more at that. So it really does kind of look like he was say standing on the you know the deck of a ship looking out at the sunset, but we have light hitting him, artificial light lighting him, well then we have that sunlight. Now we could add some glows and do some other lightings and we're gonna save that for a different day. That's something else that we are going to look at for a different time. Now, if something is a separate layer, another thing that we can do is I can just drag it from one open document to another. So I drug to the name of that document up in my um, tab bar and now here I'm going to let go and position him. Looks like uh, we will have to do a little bit more deleting. I've auto select layer turned on so now I can select and now we have him looking at himself. Go back to the quick select tool. Pay attention to which layer I'm on so then when I make my selection it works. I mean that's always important because sometimes when you're working you will think you're on one layer but you're not and then you will run into problems that you're doing something and nothing's happening. So let's say I was trying to erase something on the guy on the left so I go and grab uh, the eraser tool. I'm trying to erase his eyeball. I'm like, why won't the eyeball erase? What's going on? And then I, oh look, his layer is not active. We have to go to the layer that is active and now I could erase out his eyeball. So we can use the quick select tool very readily to select things making its selection area grow and shrink using the option or alt key on the keyboard and then we can move things through. We can copy paste between documents. Now let's say they have you know a third brother, a third, you know, they're triplets. Now I just duplicated a layer by dragging the layer down to the new layer icon. So I'll repeat that process, take layer two, drag it to the new layer icon and now we have another one. And now I will grab the move tool. And with that active, I'll turn off auto select so that I can then move him with, since I can't, oh, duh, he was on top. I wanted, actually I want, all right, we'll leave him on top. 
I want to move that one forward. But now that I've moved him forward and he's further back in space because he's behind, realistically he should be a little bit smaller. So now I can even, I can, with his layer active, choose free transform or in the control options, I can click up there to show my options and now I can shrink him down just a little bit so it's like he's in the background. So we can create these images and oh and now I need to accept that transform. Now let's go to this one and I'm just going to picture that he's in front so I'll make him a little bit bigger and then accept that. So in doing that we're able to now create this dynamic, create this relationship between these images through simple selections. And I, I think he works better, I don't know, he kind of works okay with the ocean but the, the color is a little hyper saturated on the ocean so we really do need to do a little tweaking of either the background layer or his layers color to make the whole thing blend. And we'll be saving that for a separate uh, lesson. Right now it's about being able to open your files, being able to make some selections and then move assets from one document to another. I also could now take well, I don't want to take that layer because that layer has all the extra stuff. We'll grab this one. I'm going to go put this in this document here. We'll just add him in. There he is. Well, yeah, we'll probably need to shrink him down. So we can see that this stock image that I downloaded is more than big enough for creating something to fit the assignment parameters of 6x9 at 300 dpi. So that's good. And if we did want background in. Well, let's go and grab that background. Stick that over here. We'll see that covers up the whole thing. Kind of like the cropping. Kind of like that. Uh, I like that framing that it, I like this image as a vertical, but needs to sit behind. Go and grab him and move him over and we'll just turn this into a simple face off so now we have that layer we'll do the easy transform flip horizontal once more pull it over so now we have these two who are staring at each other and then we can take the one and we can invert it so now it's his um, inverted. It's his variant if you've been uh, paying attention to uh, certain um, superhero franchises as of late. So now he has a variant. So once you get your artwork arranged, You've moved things around, you've positioned them, you've cut them out, you've cleaned them. Sometimes you may need to go in, well, maybe not quite that far, and you may need to go in and do a little bit of work just to clean it up. So maybe I want to just clean up that edge a little bit. Two options that I would contemplate on this particular one would be, no, not smudge. I wanted the sponge tool. Uh, and let's go grab the face I'm looking for, which is that one. And I could desaturate this a little bit so it's not green. The other option that I may look at is using the eraser tool. And let's uh, go to a smaller tool. The tool right now looks like it's got no hardness, which is what I want. And I can just soften up that edge here just a little bit might want it just a little bit of hardness. I think that's a little too fuzzy for me. And a little smaller brush, I think. And 
Now, if you are so lucky as to have a drawing tablet or a Cintiq, working in Photoshop is a much more dynamic and exciting experience. So you can see now that edge cleaned out, but I probably need to do a little bit around this eye as well, but yeah. This is just for demonstration purposes, so we're gonna leave it. But if you do have a drawing tablet, that does make your world even better while you are working. So when it's all said and done and you want to get a project out of Photoshop in a, as a finished version, two things. First, save your Photoshop file. You should always save the Photoshop file because if your computer crashes, you screw things up, you can always go back to it. Because this maintains the layers. Then, you can either choose save a copy or export. And in this case, I'm going to use quick export as PNG because that's going to give me a PNG file, which will be exactly what I am looking for. And now I can just save it out as a PNG, and that's it. You're done. So welcome to the exciting and infinite world of Photoshop.